Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. I'm your host, Paula Jenkins. I invite you to join me as we explore how inspiring people have chosen joy in their lives and what they have to share with us about how to jumpstart joy in the world. Plus, how do we follow our own hearts, find work that lights us up while mindfully noticing the role that joy plays in our own journey. Hello and welcome to episode 61. I'm Paula Jenkins, a life and career coach and the host of Jumpstart Your Joy. First, I want to say a really big and warm welcome to all of you guys for listening and for being out there in the audience. Today's episode is all about how to find calm in times of chaos and specifically how to overcome feeling overwhelmed and possibly somewhat depressed over the nature of this year's presidential election. If you are new to the show, welcome. (laughs) I'm so glad you're here. If you want to find out more about this specific episode, along with links to some of the other articles and things that I mention, you can head over to the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com slash episode 61. If you like what you hear and you want to subscribe to Jumpstart Your Joy, we are on all the major syndication spots, including iTunes, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Player FM. And and if you will just hit the subscribe button on one of those players, then you will continue to get the weekly updates on the show automatically delivered to your mobile device. I have a really exciting announcement before we start. If you want to start a podcast of your own, I have two amazing resources for you. I'm offering and I've just launched a five-day podcasting fundamentals course that starts off with a reference sheet that has all the hardware, software, and services that you need to know about to launch your show. The super exciting news is that this is for free, and you can go over to the site at jumpstartyourpodcast.com, and you will get the information there. Just sign up, and I'm going to send you that sheet. No strings attached. I'm also super excited to announce that I'm a brand new Libsyn affiliate, And Libsyn stands for Liberated Syndication, and they are the place where I host my podcasting files. I've been so pleased with them and their service that we've joined forces. And the benefit to you, if you sign up for hosting with them and use the very special code JOY, you will get a month of free hosting. And it actually could be up to almost two months because they will give you the month in which you sign up for free and then the following month for free. You just put that code JOY into the box when you sign up and they do the rest. To act on that, you can head over to Libsyn.com and that's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. So on to the show. Today's topic is how do you find calm in times of chaos? And specifically, how do you overcome that kind of feeling of overwhelm and disjointedness that is definitely affecting so many people out of this presidential election. And with only about a week to go, I know we all feel like we're kind of in the thick of it. I wanna be very specific up front that this is not a political show, as much as I can make it (laughs) non-political, but it is more a focus on the psychology and philosophy of what's going on in this election. I found myself asking the questions of, why does this feel so intense? And what can I do about it? That's where this topic came out of. So I will try and be as objective and non-political as I can about the two candidates. And I invite you to try and do the same as you're listening to this episode. Let's first look at why this seems to be an extremely charged presidential race. And then after that, we'll dive into what you can do and what each of us can do individually to try and break down some of the overwhelm and emotional tension that we feel, or at least I feel, over this race. The question that really came up for me is like, is why are we so triggered? Why are we so upset? What's the fervor? What's at the root of all this that makes us feel so different from some of the other presidential elections? And I really arrived at this. And again, I'll try and be as objective as I possibly can. Please do not get triggered by these words if you can help it. I'm asking you to put your political beliefs about the candidate aside and just listen as I try and explain why I believe people are where they are with this. The answer for me is that we have two extreme candidates and they are extreme in such very different ways. On the one hand, you have a very outspoken, 
white male who did really well on reality television, has a plethora of business experience, and doesn't have a political background. On the other hand, you have an extremely intelligent woman, a white woman, who has a background in politics and has been the first lady of the United States. In looking at who these people are and what they represent, there's something very triggering about them for both sides. So if you can take a step back, put your opinion <laughs> of these two to the side for just a moment. I found it very helpful to read an article that tried to help explain why people who support Trump feel so, so passionate about it. And so I wanted to dive into my understanding of why people feel so passionate on both sides. Why are people so afraid of Trump? And why are people so, so afraid of Clinton? I would love for each side to fully consider and sit with the idea that both sides are afraid of what would happen. Both sides are afraid of what the other side represents. It's not just fear on one side, it's fear on both sides. And that both sides are triggered just by the person that is running and what they think they represent. And I believe that the root of the fervor around this, this political election really comes from that fear and the way that we feel triggered by the other candidate. So let's just put down our beliefs for a second and look at maybe how the other side is seeing the other candidate. We'll start with Trump. I think that the fervor for him is coming from this place. If you are afraid of Trump, you are afraid of a world that would return the U.S. to a very oppressive state for yourself. And this would go for people of color, immigrants, people of religious affiliations, LGBTQ groups, disabled people, and frankly, women. Because Trump is not positioning himself as being welcome to diversity and the hostile and very absolute ways in which he speaks about why diverse groups should be silenced and disregarded, and in some cases removed from the country, this is upsetting and triggering to people in these groups and people who align with them or can see some part of themselves in the group. If you can listen to this, the statement of make America great again comes across as a threat to roll back the steps that have already been made towards equality and return to a time of patriarchal hierarchy when those of us in diverse groups did not have the same rights as European lineage white males did. So I want that just consider that for a moment, that these words and these ways of speaking are very triggering to people who, are, who have benefited from coming out of a time when they as a group were oppressed. On the other hand, the other candidate is a woman. I believe that those who oppose her find her triggering because having a woman as president would feel like another nod to the breaking down of an established understanding of society which is a way that feels very comfortable and defined to those who have very much benefited from having a white man in the highest office. It's triggering to them because if she is elected, it says and confirms that the old standard has changed. So stay with me. <laughs> what we have is two candidates who make the other side feel like their own life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is at stake if the other side wins the election. It's hard to talk about the issues because the fervor is not about the issues. It's about fear. So what can we do together? And what can we do as individuals to place some calm into our nation and our lives? As a nation, no matter who you are, no matter who you're voting for, acknowledge that we are collectively afraid we are walking into unknown territory with both candidates. And I think some of the fear stems from the fact that we each know that no matter who wins, we will all face change after the election is over. The topics that we are facing and that are being raised and tested, and not necessarily through the candidates' proposed agendas or their political views, but rather through what they themselves as people represent, are central to how we each live and how we relate to each other. Both of the candidates represent a shift in how we engage in our life, in our liberty, 
liberty and in our pursuit of happiness. And let's face it, any change is scary and hard. Humans don't like change. And we especially don't like the idea of change when we don't know how it will end or ultimately how it will impact us individually. As I was thinking about this particular example of us acknowledging that we're afraid, it made me think back to the days, and this is a way back, but <laughs> when the dot-com bubble burst and I was working at a prominent dot-com and we were having rolling layoffs because it was clear, well, maybe not so clear, but that the company was closing. And we would each be warned that a layoff day was coming. But to keep the peace and not cause panic, the management would schedule individual meeting times with absolutely every employee and have us walk in and then they would tell us if we were being laid off or if we would be staying on through the next round of layoffs. Now, lucky for me, I guess, <laughs> I had a friend in IT who had the list early because he would have to collect laptops and whatnot. And he would pull me aside each day and let me know if I was on the list or which list I was on. And that, and you know, so I would have the knowledge of what I was about to be told before I even met with my boss on that day. Just knowing my fate, the two times that I made the cut and stayed on, and even the last time when I was let go, which was actually a very final round or the second to final round of layoffs, uh, the end was near. It gave me a bit of comfort just from not having to face the total uncertainty of the situation. Since nobody can do for the country what my friend did for me, we are all in that state of the unknown. And the result of the election feels like it will have sweeping effects on each of us. The first thing we can all do is recognize that many of us are operating from a place of fear. And instead of playing into that fear, offer each other and ourselves compassion and kindness. Think about asking yourself, what would you do if the other person, so the person that is voicing that they support a candidate that you do not support. What would you do if that other person was a frightened child and telling you that they were scared? Or what would you do if they were your frightened child? Would you yell or keep yelling at them? Would you insist you were right if you could see that they were afraid and just push your point? None of us can know the outcome yet. So is it really worth being upset and spending a lot of energy on the outcome? Maybe ask ourselves, what happens if we shift our point of view to being one nation <laughs> under God <laughs> and focus on acting together, being kind to each other, even though we don't collectively agree? Another thought, what shifts if we see each other as being afraid and deserving of each other's respect and tenderness. I think the media right now has a lot at stake at trying to show the divisiveness of this situation. What if we decide that we are one nation under God and that we are deserving of each other's respect and tenderness? And what if we put our faith in the fact that these kinds of disagreements and times of differing ways of thinking were expected and rolled into the way our voting and election process worked Instead of seeing the other candidate as the problem, what if we had some faith, you know, what if we put the faith in ourselves and in our founding fathers and mothers that this is why they set up our country this way? What happens if we focus on the fact that we each still have a choice, both in how we act to each other and react to each other, and that we still have a choice and we get to vote? So what can we do as individuals? <laughs> Uh, the first one, step back and take a break. If something about this is not feeling right or good, if you have been obsessing and checking statistics or refreshing CNN or spending time researching the latest scandal, which is so easy to get pulled into, I would suggest that you put yourself on detox. <laughs> the news is going to continue, whether you check it hourly or once a day. Your checking it is not going to change the outcome. There is a very big difference between obsessing and taking directive action on something. And so just checking in doesn't change what the outcome will actually be. And I would encourage you to recognize that by checking repeatedly, you may actually feel more worried, more unempowered, and more helpless. And in a similar way, I would say that if you are also on social media nonstop, 
and sharing every one of the latest updates with your friends and family and followers, that just by sharing every story, you are actually fueling that fire, perhaps within yourself and perhaps with other people, but that just by the act of sharing, you are further engaging with the obsessiveness and the unpleasantness of the situation. And so taking a step back would give you that space to take a break. So how could you change this? I would suggest that maybe you vow to check in with a mindful purpose and put a time or a number limit on it for yourself. You know, you'll check in once a day as you drink your coffee or you'll check in twice a day or put some framework around it for yourself when you are checking in so that it does not become something where you're falling into the the black hole of just obsessing over what is going on. There's a really beautiful quote from Winston Churchill that's been speaking to me recently, and it is, you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. And so I'd ask, in what ways are some of the updates around some of the scandals that don't even turn out to be entirely true on both sides? How many of those are just barking dogs that we could just not pay attention to? You won't get through your day if you stop and listen to every piece of bad news that the media is sending to us. So that's the first one, to step back and take a break. Number two, take responsible, meaningful, impactful action if you feel passionate about the candidate or an issue. I think some of what happens when we start to obsess over the situations and some of the fervor that the media has thrown into this particular election is that the news itself doesn't, it leaves us feeling somewhat helpless and we don't have any control over it other than taking the step back and not really paying attention to every last breaking bit. But one way to to act on some of some of what you are feeling, and I think that's an important thing to notice, is some people have volunteered to be in a phone tree. You can make phone calls on behalf of the candidate that you want to support, work in a polling place, support a cause of one of the candidates. So if there's something they're talking about that they've been backing, you could back that too, or another one that you love. But the suggestion here is that you get out of that passive listener stance, which is completely helpless. It really, all you're doing is absorbing the news and it's fueling your feeling more helpless. So I would get out of that role of being the recipient of the news and it will allow you to feel less powerless because when you're just consuming the news around you, you have no control. So take action. That's the step. The second one is Take some mindful, meaningful action in a way that acts on the emotions or feelings that you have coming up. Number three, actively do something else that you love to do. Instead of continuing to engage with the news, instead of continuing to consume the news, go do something else. Make the mindful decision to step away from the computer, step away from the television, put down your phone, turn off your alerts, (laughs) and go outside. Get outside in your own yard, go on a hike, go walk around the lake, connect with others. You could call a friend and ask them to get together. You could read, you could do a puzzle, but get away from the kind of mesmerizing amount of information, which will likely only become more fervored as we get closer to this election night and make a mindful choice to go do something else just to clear your mind. And number four, If you're feeling a really strong emotion over an issue or a candidate, ask yourself why. It's an invitation to dig deeper. Why am I upset about this? Some of the answers will be super easy, and I'm not pretending that this is like a naive thing. But if it's an unexplained emotion or it's ongoing, dig in a little more. There's probably something there about yourself that is begging to be learned and, and, you know, unearthed. (laughs) So look at it. It's an invitation. What about that person is so upsetting to you? You could journal on the question of why do I feel this way? Why has this event or this person made me feel like this? So number five, learn about, learn more about the topic itself or about the candidate. And I want to put a very specific lens on this. The objective would be educating yourself and not obsessing about the latest mudslinging topic. It would really about be about educating yourself to, to learn more and go deeper. Go study the history of the USA. <laughs> Read the Constitution. Read a biography on one of the founding fathers or mothers. Go read about the Emancipation or the Civil War or women's rights or what healthcare has looked like in the U.S. from a historical perspective. 
go read a book about what it was like to work in a factory during the Industrial Revolution, which would be Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, <laughs> or read about the Westward Movement. There's a great book called Men to Match My Mountains by Irving Stone that has a lot of really amazing stories about what it took to tackle, you know, the West and, and move westward. In learning more, all of this will give you a much bigger vantage point on America's past and greatness and the power we hold together in continuing to grow forward. I think it's easy to feel like it's all about this present moment and the future, but I think giving yourself the perspective of what we've overcome in the past is really powerful. The country has overcome many things together. So have faith in this, this fact. And it's really beautiful to see how that's played out in the past in other really difficult situations. Number six, admit your emotions to yourself. Admit that you are angry, upset, fearful, or appalled. Admit that you are hurting. Admit that you are worried about your life and your family and your future. And then write it down. Take some action on what that emotion is can write it down. You can journal the questions I suggest before and admitting to it. You know, if you wrote it down, you could take the, the letter outside and burn it. You could go scream in your car. You could go throw rocks at the beach if you wanted to just throw them into the ocean. But recognize that you are hurt and do something that does not impact or harm yourself or others and try and release some of that fear and anger. Because getting past the emotion to see what you are upset about will allow you to create a plan to support or address what's causing the emotion and let you feel free from being stuck there. It's one thing to have the emotion, but then to stay in the space of being afraid and fearful and angry is an entirely different topic. Number seven, connect and reassure each other. Ask people for their help. Offer people help. And this could be about the election piece or it could be about anything else in the whole world. If you see someone on the bus, smile at them. If you are in line with someone in the grocery store, talk to them. You know, push out that feeling of connection and neighborliness and community. I loved that a client recently pointed out to me that community is really always two things. And that is, you know, your immediate, actual, literal community. And then those people that you choose to include in your life and in your community. And those could be two different separate groups. So I say, in your actual literal community, who can you reach out to? You know, a neighbor, who can you take cookies to? Who can you spread goodwill to, to make yourself and them feel more reconnected and reassured that we are all in this together? Because I think the other problem that comes about is there is an extreme solitude that comes out of, of feeling like we have to put up this fight. And so Reaching out to other people shows that you are not, in fact, alone because we are not alone. Number eight, and this gets a little bit political, but actually comes from a quote from Mother Teresa, and it is decide to stand for something instead of against something. In doing that, you put yourself back in this place of power and strength and positivity when you decide to stand for something. So regardless of which candidate you are supporting, which parts of them do you support? If you are going out onto social media, what message can you put out that is put in the positive vent, right? I stand for this. I, I, I support this group. I support this cause. Instead of the negative of that, which is just adding into the fuel of the fire of pushing apart things as separate and different and other which is really where then the fear continues to grow. So how can we make it that we are more connected and more loving and feeling more like this is what I stand for instead of putting yourself individually in that space of I'm against this and just see how that feels in your body. What do you notice when you stand for something? How much more powerful do you feel about yourself and your role in this, in this country and as a person? Number 10 is try on the hat of radical acceptance, radical gratitude, and radical hospitality. If you want to hear a little bit more about that one, it's something that Jan Cather Weaver says in an earlier episode that I will link up to. But what happens if you can say, I see you person that I don't necessarily agree with, and I accept you for who you are. I see you person, 
And I am grateful that we can be in this country together. I am extending radical gratitude to you and to all of us. What happens that if you can say to another person who maybe doesn't have your same beliefs, I want us to be able to be in this space. You are welcome here. I welcome you. We are all welcome in this space together. And that is radical hospitality. It comes from a place of deep love. It comes from a place of knowing that you are okay and that things will be all right. And in the end, we will still be one country, all together, indivisible. So live into those words. Really, really live into that. What does indivisible and united mean? It's part of our name. And so how do we live out those words and that promise? And I would say radical gratitude, radical hospitality, and radical acceptance are another good way of looking at that. Number 11, have faith. Have faith. Ties back into what I just said about the formation of this country. But also just have faith that there will be a November 9th. <laughs> and there will be a 2017 and a 2018. And that as a country, we have, we have gone through hard times and difficult things before. And that we will make it on the other on the other side, if you will. We will find a way through. And kind of in looking at this, there's been so many other people that have spoke up about what they are feeling and how they are feeling hurt and triggered and confused by what's going on. And just yesterday or two days ago, I found this quote, or it's kind of a paragraph. It's a lot more than just a single quote, but from Anne Lamott. And of course, she is a a religious speaker and author, and I just found that her words were so beautiful and comforting. And so I'm going to read them to you before we get to the last bit here. Um, and I thought what she had to say about faith and the situation was so beautiful. When I'm distressed, as I am now, I go to my group of friends, sober people, church, Twitter, the dog park, hoping someone will say the exact right thing to pull me out of the pinball game in my mind. The exact right thing would break the swirling trance of catastrophic thought, hit my heart's reset button, and remind me that love and grace bat last. The pond inside me would settle, and I would see through the water that most of my reactive horror and held breath were the survival tools of childhood. In parentheses, I know your family was just fine, but some of us, maybe three or four of us, grew up around miserable marriages, alcoholism, mental illness, abuse, etc., and as a result turned out just a bit more tense and controlling than the average bear. The tools did not work very well when I was six, nor did they work very well at 62, but I always fished them out first from the battered old toolbox. Remembering this means I can now move on to what may help today, a worried mercy, vulnerability, wonder. Here is the exact right thing I need to hear. The randomness and racism and brutality are just what is, but so are decency, sacrificial love, and goodness. Sometimes the scary, sickening voices seem louder than truth and beauty, but they really aren't. Democracy, the great good thing, one person, one vote, is the loudest voice in the land. Maybe God or goodness or good orderly direction or, or gift of desperation is in whom we move, live, and have our being. But the world is also a chaotic place and humanity is a chaotic place. And I am a chaotic place some days too. So I take the right action. I get my emotional acre in order through radical self-care, serving the poor, sharing my M&Ms, flirting with the very old. Then the insight follows the one I share with my Sunday school kids every single week, that all evidence to the contrary, we are loved and chosen and safe. We stick together, we share, we listen. It's good to be afraid when it mobilizes us to fight tooth and nail for what is right, when it pricks the balloon of our complacency, when it gets us back on our feet. A lot of us are both afraid and devoutfully faithful at the same time fairly often for ourselves, our kids, our elderly, our country, but what is true and the exact right thing I need to hear today is that courage is fear that has said its prayers. And I want to leave us with that as, as the thought about faith and understanding what courage and fear has to play here. And I encourage all of you to go back through these 12 things 
as you look at how this the emotional <laughs> whirlwind of this presidential election is affecting you and your family and the people around you. I invite you to dig deep and be curious and start to get your own emotional acre in order. Because like Anne Lamott says, there is this greater good. There is this deeper calling. There is this place where we will be safe and we will be loved. And I encourage all of us to have the faith that this election will work itself out and that we will find our way and that on the other side, we will all have grown in some new way and realize something new about ourselves and something new about our neighbors that is powerful and meaningful and that will eventually tie in to the greater good. The last thing I will say is go vote. <laughs> make your voice heard and make sure you don't sit home. If you are feeling emotional about this at all, this is the time to cast your vote. Give your voice the space that it has because this is really how our democracy was built. This is the power that is afforded directly to you. So I would love to hear more about what you think of this. It is such a difficult and nuanced and overwhelming topic. And so if you would like to go over to the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com slash episode 61, there will be room there for you to leave comments and I will be replying. And as we wrap up, just a couple more quick reminders. If you are feeling drawn to share your voice, if that's one of the ways that you feel like you could make an impact and you can in this world, podcasting is an awesome choice. <laughs> I happen to love it very much. If you would like that free reference sheet on how to start your show and that five-day podcasting fundamentals course, just go, go on over to Jumpstart Your Podcast and you will get more information there. Also, if you sign up for your hosting at Liberated Syndication, which is also called Libsyn, and use the code JOY, you will get your first month and then some free just for signing up with that special code and you can find them at libsyn.com that's l-i-b-s-y-n.com very nice people over there big shout out to rob for setting me up it's really a pleasure and i have to say i'm only one of i believe 33 hosts that was admitted into their affiliate program out of 60,000 shows that they host so really thank you guys i'm honored and then so next week on on the podcast in episode 62, I have my friend and brand new, shiny new author, Rosie Williams, and she'll be on the show to share about her book, Repurposed Faith, Breathing New Life into Your Quiet Time. She shares about how to take a deeper look at reconnecting with your faith and yourself. And she shares about the amazing camper that she and her husband bought at a garage sale and that they are refurbishing as an act of love and to show what happens when something that has been gone neglected is brought back to life in a beautiful act of faith so i will see you guys next week for that very uplifting episode and until then i hope that your days are filled with so much joy